Hey, it's Aaron from God A Minute. We are entering my favorite rapture season, the Passover season. Let's go. Go, Jesus, go. Can't wait for Jesus to come and get us. This life will never be perfect until we are in the clouds with our Creator, with our Messiah, the Anointed One. I've got a lot of things I can share. I've got lots of notes, but I still also, this is a live stream, so I want to be also you know, involved with the chat. So if there's ever an opportunity to, to read what you guys are saying and maybe what you are saying or, or asking can help direct the live stream, so be it. So I've got my device here. I've got my comments here. I've got my notes. I've got my Bibles all over the place. Uh, I went through, read through Hosea today. And um, good to see you guys. Hey, Julie. Hey, Sharon. Hey, Gregory. Hey, Kristen. Hey, Laura. Hey, Paul. How's everybody doing? Cindy, Billy. Christy, JT, Michelle. Yeah, good to see you guys. Good to see you guys. So, we're live. This is the God of Minute channel. At this time of the recording, it's April 21st, 2024. And um, I'm just going to start talking off the top of my mind. And then maybe I'll go up, go to my notes. And uh, we'll see where the spirit leads on this one. Uh, I'm not going to rigidly follow my comments at the beginning. So, um... Passover time. Jesus died for our sins. Big deal. Very big deal. Very, 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 very big deal. Jesus, the perfect lamb, died for our sins. Very special time. I'm going to tackle one thing that people often say. People often say, the spring feasts have already been fulfilled, therefore the rapture can't happen. Let me tell you something. Uh, Jesus, God, fulfilled all the feasts more than once multiple times. He always does things on the appointed times, the appointed moeds. So for that reason, there is a more of a reason that a rapture could happen on a Passover season. I've never said that uh, I'm never guaranteed a rapture date, and I don't encourage anybody to do that. Uh, I love the Passover season, but uh, we'll, we'll talk about some some things that connect with Passover. And um, yeah, so it's Passover, and then the next thing to look at is second Passover. We'll look at the stars a little bit right now. We'll talk openly about some things, and um, we'll go from there. And um, yeah, so I'll start off with a prayer. Father, thank you for this time. Thank you for this this time, however long we're going to hang out together. And I pray that this edifies somebody. I pray that somebody comes to you. I pray that somebody enters into a relationship with you. I pray that somebody, somebody out there says, you know what? Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sins on Passover. And uh, I pray that this video will help people understand why Jesus did in fact die on Passover and why this could maybe be a potential rapture season. In Jesus' name, amen. So I wanted to first bring up um, the Stellarium. And so um, Stellarium, let's do that. So here's Stellarium. And I wanted to just highlight a couple things that's in here. And uh, there we go. So let's go here. Let's go look at Stellarium. So we can see here that here's the moon. And there it says it's 2% here. So generally speaking, and this is from Jerusalem. So this is April 9th, Jerusalem. So this is probably Nissan 1. I haven't looked at any documents or anything like that. But generally speaking... The, the naked eye can see about 2% of the sliver of the moon, and that's generally when you start the month off. The new moon at the beginning of the year when the sun's in the ballpark of Aries, and so here we have the sun in the ballpark of Aries. We've got the new moon, and so most would agree that April 9th is the first. We could possibly say that April 10th is the first day of the month. Regardless, it's either the 9th or the 10th, the 8th, if you back it up a day, it's that was when the eclipse was happening, and it's 0%. So just for this video, I'll say somewhere around the 9th. So let's go look at Resurrection Day, and or the day that he was um, uh, killed on the cross, crucified on the cross. So that's day 1, day 2, day 3, day 4, day 5, day 6, day 7, day 8, day 9, day 10, day 11, day 12, day 13, day 14. Okay, so this would have been the day that more or less back whenever Jesus died, some say 30 AD, some say 31 AD, some say 32, some say 33. The earliest that most people would agree on is 30, and the latest that most people would agree on is 33 AD. 
And so this is equivalent to Nisan 14, the day that Jesus would have died on the cross, more or less. We have a full moon here. It's 99%. And we can see that the moon is in spica. Um, and spica represents uh, wheat or barley. She looks like she's holding a sheaf of either barley or wheat. And I, I like to think of us, if we're looking for a Passover rapture, I like to think of us as the barley. And so we have that description here. We have that, it looks like barley in the hand of Virgo. And so barley goes first for the first fruits, right? It's kind of like the early harvest. And I like to think of us as the barley. If we're in Pentecost, well, I guess we'll think of ourselves as the wheat. But <laughs> my favorite's Passover and the barley, the, the idea of the barley. So we got a full moon in the barley on the um, Nissan 14. Now, the other interesting thing is if you want to back it up a day and say that this is Nissan 14, I'm kind of okay with that, too, because the 10th could be the first day. The interesting that too, a thing about the moon being here is it's, um, let me just highlight it. I think this is actually 100%, so that's a little nicer. And it's much closer to Libra as well. So if you see, if we bump it over a, a few more hours to the 24th, it's kind of in the head of Libra. And... It's the judge, Libra represents judgment, right? It's, it's, it looks like scales. And so he paid the penalty for our sins. If you bump it over three more days, boom, boom, boom. The moon is under Ophetius. Sorry. And Ophetius conquers. Jesus, the conqueror, conquers the serpent. So uh, the 27th could be Resurrection Day. 27, 26. Oh, death, where is your sting? There's Scorpius. Oh, death, where is your victory? You know? Jesus conquered death for us. And so there's a pretty good picture in the stars right there with the moon cycle. And the 27th would be uh, as late as Saturday for Resurrection Day. We could even say Friday could be Resurrection Day. So that's just to give you a little bit of a perspective on our current year right now. So uh, there's Resurrection Day. That's Nissan 17 more or less, Friday, Saturday. And that's an awesome day. Of course, every day is an awesome day for a rapture no, because nobody really knows. But that's a really great day. Like I said, 1 Corinthians 15, O death, where is your sting? O Fecius, the champion conquering death, the serpent. Yeah. And that's three days after the moon, the full moon, was in Spica in Virgo. If you back it up three days, and you see the moon in Spica and just above Libra. So I like that. So now what's going on in the stars over here in and around this Passover week? We have um, Venus. Let's take a look here. Venus, in and around Resurrection Day, is going through the bands of the fish. And it goes through the fish after, more or less, Resurrection Day, when the time that Jesus would have r risen from the grave. And Venus, the bright and morning star, um, most of us relate Venus with the bright and morning star. That's one of the last verses in, in Revelation, the bright and morning star. And so people connect that with that. We have the sun in Aries highlighting the lamb, which is all about the Passover. So that fits nice. And we have Jupiter in really close to Uranus, and it's entering uh, Taurus. The interesting thing about that is, well, let me back up. Uranus has an 84-year cycle through the constellations, and that means heaven. If you, The Greek word for heaven is Uranus. And so Jupiter is more or less in conjunction with Uranus. I think it's like tomorrow or something. Let me just see. Around April 22nd is the closest it gets. And Jupiter and Uranus, if my memory, if my memory serves me correct, it, they they really only conjunct every 13 years or so. So remember, Jupiter came out of Virgo on the Revelation 12 sign in 2017. Most of you are familiar with that. If you're not familiar with it, just it's called the Revelation 12 sign. September 23rd, 2017, when all the planets were aligned in Virgo, Jupiter came out of the womb of Virgo. And so some people consider Jupiter to be the man-child. Well, is the man-child going to be caught up to heaven in this Passover season? Like, Jupiter is in alignment with Uranus, like now-ish, now-ish, tomorrow-ish, you, know, you know, that kind of thing. <clears throat> um... Just kind of fitting. Some people think that, like to think of Jupiter as the man-child in terms of Jesus. Um, I don't know. I mean, when it comes to planets, there's not a lot of biblical support to really... Like, there's no Bible verse that says Jupiter represents this and Venus represents that. So for me, when I look at the stars, I just think of 
I just try and be a little bit creative with, with what we're looking at. But Jupiter, um, it could represent either the raptured group, it could represent the left behind, in my opinion. But the cool thing about Jupiter is it's got an eight-year rotation going through the constellation. And I think it's a very, I think it's a very reasonable uh, creative thought to think that Taurus represents tribulation, right? You mess with the bull, you get the horns. So Jupiter enters Taurus. Um, Jupiter enters Taurus on the 28th, on Resurrection Day. That's pretty perfect. That's pretty ideal. Enters Ju enters Taurus on Passover, next weekend. After it just passed Oranos. When the sun is in the Lamb, only the Son of God saves us, the Lamb of God. Perfect. Venus is, at this point, there is an, actually a constellation of stars that's called, I think it's called IC 153, right around here, right around Venus right around to the left of that Pisces fish. And you know that verse, one was taken, one was left in Matthew 24. So it's a nice picture here of the rapture. This fish facing the throne room. Here's Cephas up here. And that's a really easy um, comparative to look. It looks like the throne room. And you never ever see the northern lights, how it, it, it's flashing. It looks like rainbow colors. In Revelation chapter 4, it's... Uh, it looks like the throne room with rainbows going around it. So this fish, is this fish going to be taken? And is this fish going to be left behind in the Passover season? You know, so we, we got a pretty neat picture for Passover. So again, the picture for Passover is the moon is in uh, Ophetius right around Resurrection Day on Friday, Saturday. The day that he would have been crucified, I guess it would have been around Tuesday, Wednesday, around Nissan 14. And we have, again, the... Venus going through that fish that looks like it's facing the throne room on the 28th, right around Resurrection Day. And we have Jupiter and Uranus meeting together at the beginning of this week, which is nice. And then Jupiter is entering Taurus uh, next weekend. So that's very neat. I like that. So there's the stars. A little bit of a connection there. A little bit of a, of a nice picture there. And uh, we all are familiar with the Red Heifers. There's a lot of action going on there. I think that this is the year they'll, they'll do, do something if they haven't done anything yet. So because they won't let a good plan go to waste, they've got their perfect heifers in their mind. So this is probably the year they're going to do that. So that's very, very interesting. Okay, so there's that. There's Stellarium. Okay, so the next thing I wanted to talk about was... Um, if you've been tracking with my videos lately, I've been talking about how 31 could make sense for a crucifixion. But I still have a soft spot for 30 AD. So I wanted to present another idea to you. I got two, two ideas to present to you. The first idea is Hosea 6 verse 2. So let me get that Bible verse up for you. I read uh, the book of Hosea today. Yeah, Christy and I wrote, 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 read some of it together, and um, it was really, Hosea is about, um, hey, you guys, you guys committed a spiritual adultery against me. I brought you out of Egypt on Passover, and then you started worshiping golden uh, cows, and then you guys, just, you guys just keep on committing spiritual adultery on me. And so he's just upset with them, and so... Hosea is talking to them directly, but then he's, he throws in some prophetic verses in Hosea. And one of the most prophetic verses in Hosea is Hosea 6-2, which seems to be a prophecy of future events. And so we're going to pull that up, okay? I already got it pulled it up. Let me, let me make this bigger for you. And so um, let me get it. Let me just get the, the King James, I guess. Okay. All right. So Hosea chapter six. He's Hosea is told to to marry um, a woman that has, you know, had adultery either on him or we're not quite sure what the story is. But he's gotten Hosea to like, okay, go marry this person because I want you to feel how I feel about Israel. Israel has just constantly turned their back on me, and enough's enough. But I'm gonna forgive them eventually. But so here's the long term prophecy in Hosea six. Okay, so. Come and let us return. And this word, return, in Hebrew is shub. 
And that's the same word that's used in Daniel 9.25 when it says restore and build Jerusalem. It's really actually return and build. And so let us return. Let us bring ourselves back in a spiritual uh, connection with our Father here. Come, let us return unto our Lord. For he hath not torn, and he will heal us, and he hath smitteth, and he will bind us up. Hosea 6.2. Okay, so after two days, he will revive us. In the third day, he will raise us up, and we shall live in his sight. Okay, so some translations will say, um, on this verse, let me go back to it, my apologies. Hosea 6, 2, some verses will say, on the third day. So let me just get this. See this, how it says, on the third day, right here? On the third day. On the third day. This one says, in. Uh, but my Hebrew Bible will say, on. On the third day. In the third day, on the third day. Okay, so here's the thought. After two days, we know that a day is like a thousand years, right? So most people are, are familiar with that um, that verse. It's uh, is it First Peter or Second Peter, uh, chapter three? Yeah, it's Second Peter chapter three. Let me go over there and, and then I'll come back to it to show you Second Peter chapter three, and that's verse eight. But beloved. Be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years, and a thousand years as one day. So that's 2 Peter 3, 8. So if you go back to Hosea verse 6, verse 2, uh, chapter 6, verse 2, where are we? Hosea, 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 yeah, there you are. And after two days he will revive us, and the third day he will raise us up, and we shall live in his sight. So here's my thinking. After two days, so after 2,000 years, not necessarily a perfect 2,000 years from the cross, but after two days, or after 2,000 years, he will revive us in, in the third day. So what this verse might be telling us, that there might literally be 2,001 day, or one years, 2,001 years from the cross event. So today I was like, okay, because last year, I just, I really loved all the connections for 30 AD. And um, here we have Hosea 6, verse 2. After two days, he will revive us, and in the third day, he will raise us up. So my line of thinking was, I still like 30 AD, but I like 31 AD a lot, too. And, you know, everybody knows there's, there's a little bit of wiggle room because every scholar can't agree. And I've done all the math and went backwards and forwards, and I'm like, yeah, I understand the discrepancy between all the years of when Christ died. But if Hosea 6.2, if we take it for what it looks to be, and we take it very literally, it looks like Christ's second coming. It might mean that his second coming would be 2,001 years after the date of the crucifixion, after two days, on the third day. I hope that makes sense to you, right? So, um... In my mind, it's 2,001 years after the cross event. That could be what that verse is getting to. And so if Jesus died in 30 AD, he could simply just have a second coming in 2031, and therefore the rapture 2024. Hope that makes sense. I still like 31 AD a lot, too. And the one thing that I found is that uh, this, I'll show you real quick, too. I can show you right here. And we'll do that, and we'll do that, and we'll do this. And this is the um, my timeline that I had made in my, my video before. But we have the um, the decree given to Ezra in, in Ezra 7. And then we have a nice, perfect seven weeks that brings us to the time of 408 BC when they had a full return and a for, full rebuilding of Jerusalem and its walls and the return of the people in Nehemiah chapter 12, during the reign of Darius II, Nathas. And so what we have, we, we've got a nice, beautiful fulfillment of Daniel 9, 25. If we start from the decree of 457 BC, we end up having 49 weeks or 7 weeks to going to 408 BC. And then we have a nice, beautiful connection to 27 AD, his baptism. It all makes sense for 27 AD being the time of his crucif— uh, sorry, the time of his um, baptism— the anointing of the Messiah. I could also be convinced, though, that 
it was 458 BC to 409 BC, and therefore having his baptism in 2680. I can be convinced of that, but we can't go any shorter than that, and we can't go any longer than that. That seems to be pretty locked in. It's pretty locked in with these decrees that he either got baptized in 2680 or 2780. We can't push that any further. If we're going to pick a different date, we've got to pick an entirely different decree. We have to pick the decree given to Nehemiah only, but then we don't have any biblical support for a 49-week gap after that. So I don't think we can really push the can much further than 2780 for a baptism. And we can't go any earlier than 2680 because of all the genealogies listed in Luke chap chapter 3, verse 1, of all, you know, there's Tiberius and there's a handful of other guys. You can't go any earlier than 2680 for a baptism. So, um, I can I can still be, with this Hosea 6-2 thought that I've got, I can still be like, okay, okay, I could still be okay with a 30 AD crucifixion if the second coming was meant to be a 2001 years after after um, the crucifixion. I hope that makes sense. I hope I'm not losing anybody on that. So so there's a thought there. So I did the Slarium thing. Talked about Hosea. Um, another thought that I'll just say again, the fig tree generation. What do we do with that? People are scratching their heads. I don't have all my notes written down here, but um, let's see if I can remember with the top of my head. And my memory's not that great. I... It's very possible that we can simply apply the fig tree generation, the 80 years, to Israel, turning 80, by the midpoint. That might be it. That might be it. I mean, I'll say this. It's a fantastic argument for right now. It's a really good argument for right now. 1948 plus 80 years is 2028. So by the midpoint, if the midpoint is December 2027, at Christmas, at Hanukkah, like I've talked about before, that's 79 and a half years from their birthday. That's pretty good. That fits like a glove. And if you read the Bible verse, I'll, I'll read it. Uh, let's see, this is where I'm going to test my memory now. So we're going to go to Matthew 24, 14. So Matthew 24, 14. Or Matthew 24, no, it's a bit after that. It's 15. Okay. But pray that ye that your flight be not in winter, neither on the Sabbath day. This is after talking about the abomination of desolation. But here's the word flight, all right? Flight. And then in Revelation chapter 12, when it's talking about Israel giving birth to a male child, and so she brought forth a male child, who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and her child was caught up unto God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she hath a place prepared of God. But later on, it talks about the woman with uh, wings. Here it is. And to the woman were given two wings, wings, wings of a great eagle, and that she might fly. So we got that verse in Matthew 24, talking about flying. Now we got a verse in Revelation 12, verse 14, which we know is Israel flying to the wilderness. Um, and then we go to Psalm 90, verse 10, which is the verse. And we've got, let's see here. It's talking about flying. The days of our years and threescore years and ten, and if by reason of strength they be fourscore years, that's 80. It is, it is their strength, labor, and sorrow, for it is soon cut off, and we fly away. Well, that's, that fits really nice. So Psalm 90 verse 10 is talking about flying away. The halfway point is saying to pray that your flight not be in winter. Uh, Revelation 12 is talking about Israel having wings that flies away. What does Psalm 91 say? The the chapter after it? Uh, Surely he, will, he shall deliver thee from the snare of the fowler. Well, the fowler is somebody who tries to catch birds specifically. All right. So it's just an interesting thought that really fits right now. I am not dogmatic about this idea, but I think this fits really great. And I was in Hosea as well, and I can't remember the verses off the top of my mind, but I read it in my hard copy. I did highlight it, so let me see if I can find it really quick. I'm just opening up my Bible. It's talking about uh, Ephraim and verse 7, verse 11. So this is uh, Hosea 7, 11. 
Hosea 7.11. Okay. Ephraim also is like a silly dove without heart. So now he's describing Ephraim as a bird. And there was other bird references in Hosea as well. Um, just let me look at my hard copy real quick here. Let me see if there's anything else here. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Hosea 9.11. Hosea 9.11 is also saying that. As for Ephraim, their glory shall fly away like a bird from the birth and from the womb and from the conception. So we have a reasonable uh, connection here with, um, you know, the fig tree generation applying for the midpoint. The fifth of the 80 years. What are we going to do with that? We'll see. We'll see what happens. Okay, so I talked about the stars a little bit. Talked about uh, the midpoint. We could talk about Passover. Let me just check the, the comments and see if you guys have any questions before I take off here and dive into some of the notes that I've got. I see some people are debating about the cross. Just whatever you say, just be super kind and nice about that. <laughs> Don't be dogmatic about it. And, uh, okay. All right. I can talk about some, uh, some of my notes here. All right. So... I know I should be wearing my rapture helmet. I hear you. I know. Ephraim. Okay, so Ephraim, I should say, um, for the most part, uh, Ephraim represents the northern kingdom and Judah represents the southern kingdom. Ephraim was one of the tribes of Israel, but it ended up being one of the larger tribes in Israel. So they kind of just started calling the northern kingdom Ephraim. Instead of calling it the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom, They kind of, in, in the Bible, they, they would often say, Ephraim, or Ephraim, however you want to say it. Um, Ephraim is the northern kingdom, and Judah would be the southern kingdom. Just kind of a an overall name for, for, for Israel in general, in the scripture. Okay, so I wrote some notes down. Some of these notes I've, I've said in other videos, but a lot of these notes come from a video called The Mind-Blowing Significance of Passover as Prophecy by Mike Winger. I'll say that one more time. This channel name is Mike Winger, and the mind-blowing significance of Passover as prophecy is the video title. A lot of these notes were taken from his video, so I appreciate this brother who kind of put a lot of verses together. And so here we are. We're looking at the Passover season, and I uh, just wrote a couple point forms from the video that he presented, and uh, we might bounce around and go through that. So yeah, so we're looking at a potential rapture in Passover, but why? So Passover was the 10th plague of release of the people in Egypt. It started off, the whole the whole picture of Passover, it was a time of departure. It was a time of uh, saving from Egypt, saving from the gods, saving from death, saving from slavery. And it was a, a change of location from one location to another. Aren't we waiting for that, in, for the rapture? Of course we are. We're waiting for a, t we're waiting for a location change. And that's exactly what Passover was that's when it started. Another point here is um, Christ chose Passover. So if we go to John 12, verse 23, and we, um, we see that Jesus is about to be crucified, and he's talking, he's, this is the triumphal entry. And what does he say here? And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour has come that the Son of Man should be glorified. So Jesus uh, chose Passover to die for our sins. This was a predetermined predetermined thought. There's many times in the New Testament where Jesus said things like, it's not my time yet. My hour has not yet come. I, I can't be killed right now. I have to wait. I've got to be crucified on Passover. And if you're unfamiliar with all this, you'll understand why pretty soon. So, Passover was a time that he chose, John 12, 23. Um, in 1 Corinthians 5, 7, what we have here is, Purge out therefore the old leaven, that ye may be a new lump, 
as ye are unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed. And some versions on this verse will say, our Passover lamb. Let's see if uh, on my computer here it says anything about a Passover lamb. Oh yeah, so right here, the ESV says Passover lamb. In 1 Corinthians 5, 7. So Christ, the scripture says that Christ was our Passover lamb. Well, in Exodus, that's what that's what they did. So let me go over to Exodus. Uh, after seeing 1 Corinthians 5, 7, Christ was our Passover lamb. And we'll go back to Exodus chapter 12. We'll probably go back and forth from Exodus 12 a lot here to explain. And we're going to go right here. And it says, And the Lord spoke unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of the months, and it shall be the first month of the year to you. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month they shall take to them every man a lamb. A lamb. Jesus said he is the Lamb of God. And this is the time of Passover. This is um, on the tenth day you'd get your lamb, according to Exodus 12, and you bring it to your house, but then you would slaughter it on the fourteenth day of, of Nisan. And that's exactly what Jesus did. He rode in on a donkey, on a lamb, or <laughs> he rode in on a donkey. He was the Lamb of God, the Passover lamb. He came in to town on a donkey on Nisan 10, just like Exodus 12 verse 3 uh, is talking about here. So he fulfilled scripture. He fulfilled the time of Passover. He became our Passover lamb. And so, what does it say in Exodus 12, verse 7? And they shall take of the blood and strike it on the two doorposts. Yeah. So the lamb is the lamb's blood is meant to go in the doorpost. So that's Exodus um, 12, verse 7. And Exodus 12, verse 22. So it wasn't our own blood that saved us it was the blood of the lamb and so here you're, you're supposed to slaughter the lamb on the 14th right here and kill it and so not only that the congregation of israel was to kill the lamb and that's exactly what happened when jesus died on the cross the congregation of israel decided crucify him crucify him and they did they fulfilled scripture without even knowing it so Exodus 12, verse 7 says you need to put your blood and strike it on, on the two doorposts. Well, if you picture a tov, it looks like that. Uh, in, in Hebrew, we've, t we've shown symbols of Hebrew before, but if you put the blood uh, of Christ, let me see if there's a tov here. No, it's not on there, but let me see if it would be on the, if I can find, I can't find, uh, wait, let me think here. What? Okay, let me go to the first verse, the bare sheet. I know there's a, I know there's a tab there. I can show you here. Well, actually, right here. Boom. That's what we do. So you see right here, it's very small for you. Let me see if I can go bigger. Okay. You see this tab right here? That's a tab in the, in the corner. It's got a line and a cross and a line down. So that's what a tab would look like. But that looks like how you, would, how you would paint blood on the door. So the tab, which is a symbol of a cross, is how they drew it, the blood on the door. Isn't that, isn't that something? That's so perfect. So going over to Exodus 12, verse 22, and ye shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood. There is the blood. Nothing saves you but the blood of Christ. That is in the basin and strike the lintel and the two side posts with the blood that is in the basin and none of you shall go out at the door of his house until the morning. If we go over to Hebrews chapter 9, we see some more detail there. And this whole chapter is talking about the tabernacle and the high priest, and there's lots of stuff in here. But Hebrews 9, 11, and 12, it says, But Christ, being being uh, come our high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. So because... Christ shed his perfect blood on the cross, and because the Lamb's blood in Exodus was a foreshadow of things to come, now we can enter into the Holy of Holies because of what Christ did for us. He tore the veil. He tore the separation for us. So we can enter the presence of God because of what happened on Passover. So what a beautiful story and connection to point a rapture, a potential rapture on a Passover. Here we are, looking at Passover this week, waiting to enter the presence of God. 
And because of the blood spilled on Passover for a perfect lamb, um, we can now enter the presence of God. We're capable of entering the presence of God because of what Christ did for us, not because of what we did, but because of what Christ did. And um, notice that they didn't uh, inspect they didn't in inspect the person. They inspected the uh, the lamb. The lamb was the one that was inspected, not the person. So uh, if we go back to Exodus 12 now, we have Twelve and twelve through thirteen, for I will pass through the land of Egypt this night, and will smite all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I, the Lord, and the blood, shall be for you a token upon the houses where you are. And when I see the blood, I will pass over you, and the plague shall not be upon you to destroy you, when I smite the land of Egypt. So the point here is, no one is exempt. No one is exempt, Israelite or Egyptian. You must all put the blood on your door. If you do not put the blood on your door, I don't care if you're an Israelite, Egyptian, black, white, purple, brown, maroon, uh, you know, child, adult, you need the blood of Christ to cover you. Doesn't matter what country you're from. Doesn't matter what job you have. Doesn't matter how good you are. You need the blood of Christ to cover you. No one is exempt. You don't put the blood on the door, you're done. Your firstborn's done. Okay, so um, Israel wasn't even innocent. You know, they were they were even drawn into some of the pagan traditions there too. You know, and he was trying to take them out of that. And it says that in Ezekiel chapter twenty. Ezekiel chapter twenty, verse six through eight. In the day I lifted up mine hand unto them to bring them forth uh, of the land of Egypt into a land that I had espied. For them flowing with milk and honey, which is the glory of all the lands. Then said I unto them, Cast ye away every man the abominations of his eyes, and defile not yourselves with the idols of Egypt. I am the Lord your God. But they rebelled against me, and would not hearken unto me. They did not even, they did not. Every man cast away the abominations of their eyes, neither did they forsake the idols of Egypt. Then I said, I will pour out my fury upon them to accomplish my anger against them in the midst of the land of Egypt. So, um, there's that. Matthew 26 is talking about Passover. Judas betrays Jesus. And, you know, if you understand what a Galilean wedding is, a Galilean wedding is when a, um, a groom would propose to a soon-to-be bride, and he would offer a cup of wine. And in the Galilean wedding custom, if she drank the cup of wine, it was she was saying, "I do. I will marry you." And so the agreement was put in place. He would go to his father's house and build an extension on his father's house. And only the father knew when the father would send the son to get his bride in the middle of the night. the The men would go and carry, blow trumpets in in the night, and they would carry her away in a litter above the ground in the sky. And bring her back. They would have a marriage ceremony, and it was seven days long. They would consummate, and they would have a marriage ceremony and party. If the guests didn't come quick enough, they would be left out of the wedding celebration. So you're supposed to be alert. You're supposed to be um, just ready for your groom. And so uh, this whole concept of the rapture being tied to a to a marriage ceremony is just a the best picture I could describe. Such a wonderful picture. And so that was part of the Galilean culture. And so having said that, when we read the scripture, now knowing that there's a bit of a wedding imagery here, we see here Matthew 26, uh, 26, And as they were eating, Jesus took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat, this is my body. And he took the cup and he gave things and he gave it to them saying, Drink ye all of it, for this is my blood, of the New Testament, which is shed for many for the remission of sins. But I say unto you, I will not drink henceforth of this fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new with you in my Father's kingdom. Well, isn't that awesome? He's basically proposing and saying, 
I'm going to wait for you when I come and get you. I'll drink it with you in my father's kingdom. Perfect. That's great. He's a romantic guy, isn't he? John 1 29. The next day, John seeth Jesus coming in unto him and saith, Behold, the Lamb of God. So right away, right out, right out of the gate. Here's Jesus. What are we going to call him? I don't know. Let's call him the Lamb of God. Of course. He's supposed to die for our sins. He's supposed to be the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. John is identifying him right away as the Lamb of God, the Passover Lamb who died for our sins. Because of what happened on Passover, we will be transformed eternally. Whether the rapture happens at Passover or not, it's because of Passover that we are able to go to heaven and meet and be with our Savior forever and ever and ever. So even if we don't get raptured, this is just a beautiful thing to understand that uh, Jesus died for us as the perfect Passover lamb. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Uh, let's go back to Exodus 12, verse 5, and show that it had to be a male lamb. So here's Exodus 12, verse 5. Your lamb, your Passover lamb, your Jesus, shall be without blemish. And that's what Jesus was. He was without blemish. And a male of the first year. Now, I haven't done much research on this, but apparently a male in its first year would be considered an adult. So um, it's almost like saying a male in his prime. Now, a male in his prime, I would think most people would agree that it's probably around the age of 30. Most athletes are in their late 20s, early 30s. Uh, most wisdom and you know brain power and function is really close to around 30. So when you're sacrificing a male in of the first year, a male lamb, you're sacrificing a male that's actually very significant and it's got a lot of value to you. And so uh, Exodus 12, 12, 5, it's got to be a male without blemish. And you've got to sacrifice something that actually means something to you. And just think of it too. If you if you got a lamb and you bring it to your house on the 10th day of Nisan and you slaughter it on the 14th day, you're going to probably develop a little bit of a relationship with the lamb. Because lambs are cute. Let's face it. They're cute. They're fluffy. They, they're like a pet. They're innocent. And um, I bet you most people that sacrifice the lamb are probably kind of sad. But that's a good and natural thing to, to, to experience that. Because it's... It's a hard thing what Jesus did for us. Um, he became sin so that we uh, knew no sin. He came, became sin for us. So if we go over to 1 Corinthians 15, verse 22. Oops, that's Chronicles. Let's go over there. 1 Corinthians 15, 22. It had to be a male lamb. Why did it have to be a male lamb? 15, 22. For as in Adam, the first man, right there, all die. So we're all appointed to death because the first Adam, Adam and Eve, uh, for as in Adam all die, even so in Christ shall all be made alive. So if we stay high five in the first Adam and we don't convert to be under the second Adam, which is Christ, we are done for. We we are appointed to death. We, we came into the world a sinner. And so that's why this lamb had to be male. And so if we... Later on, this whole chapter is amazing, but if we go over to 1 Corinthians um, 15, uh, what is it? Is it 45 or 44? Um, where I just lost myself. Oh, yeah, 45. Uh, so 1 Corinthians 15, 45. And so it was written, the first man, Adam, so there's your first man, Adam, was made a living soul. But the last Adam was made a quickening spirit. So Jesus is the last Adam. Jesus is... The, the second Adam, if you will, who takes away the sins because uh, the first man is of the earth. The second man is the Lord from heaven. See that in 1 Corinthians 15, 47? Perfect. So the male lamb, the second uh, lamb, or the, you know what I mean? The second man is, is Jesus. Okay, so there's that. If we bounce over to Hebrews 4, verse 17, what do we have here? Is it 4.15 maybe? And this is uh, just showing you that Jesus was without sin. For we have not uh, an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, 
but was in all points tempted like us, we are yet without sin. So Jesus was without sin, and the scripture just says it plainly right here in Hebrews 4, 15. And remember, the lamb had to be without blemish in Exodus chapter 12. So that's perfect. Um, if we go to 1 Peter 1, 19, we get a similar theme here. 1 Peter 1, 19. Uh, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish. Ah, see that? Lamb without blemish, fulfilling Exodus 12 to a T. The blood of Christ, the blood of the lamb on your door. The reason why they were able to escape slavery, the reason why they were able to relocate was because of the, the perfect blood of the lamb. That's why we will be able to escape at some point because of the blood of Christ. And just to remind you, um, it was the lamb that was inspected, not the person. You may be a sinner. You may have made a lot of mistakes in your life. I've made a lot of mistakes. Uh, I'll, I'll raise my hand. I'll raise my hand. Yep, I've made mistakes. I know that you guys have made your mistakes. Everybody here is guilty. We're all guilty. If we're all honest with ourselves, we're all guilty. We're all struggling with something right now. I get it. I'm a human. You're a human. We got issues. Good thing. I'm not judged based on my issues. Otherwise, I'm not getting into heaven. No way, no how. No way, never, never will. Only by the, the blood of Christ. And I boast in what Christ did for me, not of what I did. That, that's a scripture too. Maybe we'll find it later, but um, it's by the blood on our doorpost. Psalm 18, verse 26, we have. Yeah, that's a song. You got issues. Oh, yeah. Uh, Cindy, yeah, that's, uh, you got a friend in me, you got a friend in me, I got troubles with, him. you got them too, actually the words are different, we stick together, we can see it through, yeah, you got a friend in me, you got issues, I got them too, well, okay, that, maybe that lyric isn't quite in the song, but I was pretty close, okay, um, Psalm 118, verse 26, so this was a prophecy that was fulfilled at the triumphal entry. Psalm 118. Where are we? Where are we? Oh, there we go. Psalm 118. And so Jesus is riding in on a donkey on Nisan 10. And what do they say? Blessed be he that cometh in the name of the Lord. We have blessed you out of the house of the Lord. So blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Well, what do they say in Matthew 21, verse 9, when they're when he's coming in on the triumphal entry? And the multitudes that went before and that followed cried, saying, Hosanna, the son of David. Blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. And so they're 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 screaming out Psalm 118 verse 26. They're like, yeah, this is our Messiah. They, but the thing is, they thought Israel thought Jerusalem thought the people in there they thought that he was going to come and rule and reign and take over with force, and he was going to be like some, you know, human hero. They didn't realize that he was coming to die for them. They didn't realize that he was acting as the Lamb that was coming in on Nisan 10, like Exodus 12, to die for them. They didn't even know. They didn't even know. But they were sincerely saying hey hosanna to the son of david because they were promised that jesus was their messiah was going to come from the seed of david and we know that jesus did come from the seed of david david died approximately three thousand years from the second coming whenever that's going to be and uh he died around 970 bc more or less which is a perfect three thousand years from our potential second coming and so they're saying hosanna to the son of david the seed of david our messiah Oh, man, so they were fulfilling Scripture without even realizing it. And um, and just to remind you that they he was examined between Nisan 10, so the Lamb in Exodus would be examined between Nisan 10 and Nisan 14. And so what was going on between Nisan 10 and Nisan 14? They were examining Christ. They were, doing, they were fulfilling Scripture, just like the Lamb was to be examined in Exodus 12. He's he's being portrayed and he's being examined. And then in uh, Matthew 26, verse 59, 
Now the chief priests and the elders and all the council sought false witness against Jerusalem to put him to death, but they found none. They found no blemish. Yea, though many are false witnesses came, yet found they, they didn't find anything. At last, at the last came two false witnesses. So they're, of course, lying about him and, and misrepresenting what he said and things like that, but they could not find no fault. Why? Because he had no blemish. Isn't that something? John 19, verse 4. We've got a similar pattern here. Pilate therefore went from again and saith unto them, Behold, I bring him forth to you that ye may know that I find no fault. I find no fault with him, guys. He's like, why do you want to kill him? I mean, I wash my hands at this guy. I don't know. I don't know what you guys want. So there's no fault. So here is the lamb being um, being looked at and examined, and nobody can find any true fault with him. In Exodus 12, verse 26, the other rule that we have here is, it says, don't break his bones, basically. So let's go get it. Exodus 12, 46. Uh, in one house shall it be eaten. Thou shalt not carry forth out of the flesh a broad of the house, neither shall ye break a bone thereof. So on Passover, don't break the lamb's bones. Don't do it. All right. Well, what happens in John 19, verse 33? So he's crucified, and then they usually try and break the legs and stuff so that the person on the cross would die quickly. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was dead already, they break not his legs. So they didn't break Christ's legs. So they fulfilled Scripture. They fulfilled Exodus 12, verse 46. Everything that happened with the cross was a fulfillment of Scripture. Isn't that perfect? And also in Exodus 12, verse 3, we have, it says that, Speak un ye unto the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of the month they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to his house. So it's for the whole house. But we are grafted into the house of God because of the lamb. So it's a bit of a community thing, right? Once you, once you become a believer, you become part of the family of God. And that's why we call each other brothers and sisters in Christ, because of the Passover lamb. That's so exciting, too. We become family, permanent family, brothers and sisters in Christ. Ephesians 2.19, Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints of the household of God. You become a brother and sister in the household of God when you become part of the family. So if you're not saved, you get to become a brother or sister in Christ if you do get saved. Isn't that amazing? And your brother and sister is not just blood brothers and sisters. It's somebody that is one in Christ with you. It's such an exciting thing. In John chapter 3, verse 1, is it John 3, 1? Um, oh, I, sorry, I meant to say 1 John, 1 John 3, verse 1. Behold, what manner of love that the Father hath bestowed upon us, that we should be called the sons of God. We become a son of God. We become a child of God. That's it. That's all. Therefore, the world knoweth us not, because it knew him not. We become a child of God. When we become a believer in what the Lamb of, of God did for us, we become a child of God, and that's it, and that's all. That's it, that's all. Amazing. Like I said before, in Exodus chapter 12, verse 6, the congregation of Israel shall kill it in the evening. And... I don't have my scripture right now, but there, what is the verse where it says, crucify him, crucify him? Is that in Matthew or is that, let me just see if I can find it real quick. Mm. Well, oh yeah, let him be crucified. Uh, I guess it's Matthew 27, 22, is that it? Let me see, let's see here, Matthew 27, 22. The governor answered and said unto them, Whether of the twine will ye that I release unto you? They said, Barabbas. Um, oh yeah, Pilate said unto them, What shall I do then with Jesus, which is called Christ? 
they all say unto him, let him be crucified. Okay, so they're all screaming, let him be crucified. So they're fulfilling that verse in, in, uh, in Exodus. Let him be crucified. So here's another crazy thing too, Barabbas. So bara means son. Bara, bara, son, and Abba means father. So we got bara, bara, and Abba, son of the father. So Barabbas, it means son of the father. And so it's so funny because Jesus is the son of the father, all right, the son of the God. So it, they're saying, hey, um, the governor is saying, do you want me to release the son of the father or do you want me to release the son of the father? Do you want me to release Barabbas number one or Barabbas number two? Which Barabbas do you want me to release to you? And of course, they, they scream for Jesus. And take note here, the Strong's number for Jesus is G2424. That's just a fun little side note. And uh, we are in 2024 right now. And uh, according to Ron Wyatt, Jesus had 24 uh, chromosomes in his blood. And we also know that the Ark, the Mercy Seat, was made out of pure gold. And we would classify pure gold as 24 karat gold. So if Ron Wyatt is correct in that his blood went onto the mercy seat uh, at the time of the crucifixion. His blood of 24 chromosomes dripped down and fell on the mercy seat that also had 24 karat gold. And now we have a strong number of Jesus being 24, 24. Well, I like numbers and I like patterns, so that is pretty neat. And here we are entering the Passover season. Okay, so there's that. What's the next thing on my page here? <laughs> okay, another thing to note is the the word lamb in this uh, in this app. This is my eSword app, by the way, if anybody's wondering. And it has 29 matches in the book of Revelation for the word lamb. So the word is mentioned 29 times in the book of Revelation, the word lamb. Whenever it's talking about Jesus, it's always referring to the Lamb. The Lamb did this, and the Lamb did that. The Lamb did this. Praise to the Lamb. Praise this. Praise that. Lamb, 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 Lamb. And the Lamb opened the seals, and the Lamb did that. So I'll just give you a couple examples. I won't show all of them, but Revelation 5, verse 6. Who opens the seals? And on one of the elders saith unto me, Weep not. Behold, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, the Root of David, hath prevailed to open the book. And... Um, to loose the seven seals thereof. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and of the four beasts, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb, as it had been slain. So there you go, you got a lamb right there. So, you get the visual of the lamb. And then in Revelation 8, um, where are we here? 8 through 10. And when he had taken the, the book, the four beasts and the four twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. And they sung a new song, saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by the blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. And so there's other verses in Revelation. There's, Like I said, there's 29 matches. Um, Revelation 5, 12, 5, 12, saying with a loud voice, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. And uh, one more that I wanted to show you was uh, Revelation 15, 3. And then we'll go to another theme here. And they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are thy works, Lord God Almighty, just and true. I are thy ways, thou king of saints. So that's that. Okay, so Mark uh, 18, verse 3. I have Jesus had to die. So let's see, Mark 18, verse... Oh, is it Mark 18, verse 3? No, I wrote something wrong. I'll skip this note. I don't know what I was trying to say here. I must have wrote, written, my, written my note wrong because um, it's not the right one. Maybe it's supposed to be Matthew 18, verse 3, if this isn't it. The point is that Jesus had to die. No, that's not it. Okay, let's skip that note. Um, another important note 
uh, that Jesus fulfilled is it had to be done in Jerusalem. So Deuteronomy 16, verse 2, Thou shalt therefore sacrifice the Passover unto the Lord thy God of the flock and the herd in the place where the Lord shall choose to place his name. So um, there's three valleys in Jerusalem, and it looks like a shin. It looks like the shape of a shin, which is another name for God, El Shaddai. And so in Second Chronicles 6.6, 6, we have, But I have chosen Jerusalem, that my name might be there, and I have chosen David to be over my people Israel. And we find that same kind of verbiage in the same book, Second Chronicles 33. Verse 4, looks like, also, he built altars in the house of the Lord, where the Lord had said, In Jerusalem shall be my name forever. Jerusalem shall be my name forever. And verse 7. Jerusalem, which I have chosen uh, before the tribes of Israel, I will put their name forever. So Jesus had to be crucified in Jerusalem according to Scripture, and he was. And he was. So he fulfilled that. And he's going to be there for his second coming as well. That's where the party is going to be. In, in that area. Now, I said earlier on that they put blood on the door. And so, let's let's pull out the obvious verse here. What does Jesus call himself in John 10? He says in John 10, verse 1, that he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, that same is a thief and a robber. But then later on in this verse, he says that he says unto unto them, Verily, verily, I say unto you that I am the door of the sheep. I am the door of the sheep. And over here, John 10, verse 9, I am the door by me. If any man enter in, he shall be saved and shall go in and out and find a pasture. So you cannot enter king, the kingdom without going through the door, which is Christ. And so remember, they put the blood of the lamb on the door. Perfect. He's just fulfilling scripture. It's all about Passover. Everything points to Passover. And so also we have a prophetic picture. I'm not going to read this Genesis, this chapter, but I'm just going to point it out to you. In Genesis chapter 22 is when a Abraham is asked to sacrifice Isaac. And here is a perfect, it's like a prophetic foreshadow of what happened with uh, with Christ. Some, some would say that uh, Isaac was sacrificed on the very mountain that Jesus actually died on. And uh, I'm sure that that is the case. I think it's Mount Moriah if we read through this properly um, but the point is um, that Abraham sacrificing Isaac or at least attempting to and then he was stopped uh, was a perfect foreshadow of Christ so everything's always pointing to Passover and always pointing to Christ and here we are in the week of Passover so so awesome um, Matthew 27 51 what does that say let's see here Oh, yeah. This is when the veil was torn. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent in twain from top to bottom, and the earth did quake, and the rocks rent, and the graves were open, and the many bodies of the saints which slept arose. So the dead rose and walked around. Isn't that nuts? And the veil was torn. Isn't that nuts? But the veil was the curtain that, was, that separated the holy place from the holy of holies. So the high priests were the only ones that were able to enter the Holy of Holies on the Day of Atonement. And the normal priests could only enter the, the sanctuary, the, the, the room with the, um, the, the lampstands and the, uh, the table of showbread. They couldn't go beyond the veil. But when Christ was crucified, he tore the veil so that separation was gone. And so what do we have in Hebrews 10 now? Hebrews 10. Hebrews 10, 19 through 20. We have, Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Ah, see that? The veil was torn because Hebrews 10 is explaining to us why. Because now we can enter with boldness the holy of holies in a spiritual sense by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh and having a high priest over the house of God. 
So Jesus became our high priest. He tore the veil, so now we can be in the presence of God because of what happened on Passover. Oh, man. Isn't that something? Isn't that something? So Such a special thing. First Corinthians 11, 26. This is also a special thing, too. We read this when we're doing communion. And I'll just read from 25, 25 and 26. After the same manner, also, he took the cup when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. In my blood. I'm the lamb. I'm the perfect lamb. The unblemished lamb that came on Nisan 10. And uh, I'm going to die on Nisan 14, just like I was supposed to. Um, anyway, this is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, ye sow the Lord's death. But here's, here's the, the highlight right here. Till he come. Till he come. You're supposed to remember the Passover. Remember why he died on the cross for us. He died for our sins. He broke his body, shed his perfect blood as our Passover lamb. But what are we, what else are we doing? We're supposed to do this until he comes. So there's this constant anticipation with Passover. It's, it's not only remembering what he did, but it's remembering what he promised. He promised that he's going to come again. And we do this on Passover to remember that he is coming again. Hallelujah to that. Hallelujah to that. Passover is a time to remember what he did. And also to remember the promises that he gave us. So that's beautiful right there. Another interesting thing here is Ezra 6, well, Ezra 7 is we get this decree from Artaxerxes, okay? And this is given to Ezra. And this happened in around 457 BC. If you add 69 normal weeks to that, you get to the time of when Jesus was anointed uh, to be the Messiah at his baptism at the beginning of his ministry. So this Ezra 7 is a very significant uh, chapter pointing to the arrival of Christ. If you haven't checked out the Daniel 9 videos I did recently, please check those out. I don't need to go that, into that right now, but Ezra 7 is pointing to the arrival of Jesus, the Messiah, and then thereafter... Uh, the eventual crucifixion of Jesus, the Passover lamb. But before this very significant chapter, in Ezra chapter 7, what happens in the chapter before it? At the very, very end of this chapter, they, the temple is finished and they dedicate the temple. And in Ezra chapter 6, verse 19, what do they do? And the children of the captivity kept the Passover Oh man, they're fulfilling scripture here too, up on the 14th day. So, there they go, they're doing it. So, when people say, oh look, Passover's already been fulfilled, like nothing's going to happen on Passover, or, or you know, the spring feasts have already been fulfilled, and the only other rapture option is trumpets. Yeah, look, when, when we're there and we're right in front of trumpets, I'm, I'm gung-ho for trumpets. But what I'm going to show you here is this. In Ezra 6, 19, they did Passover. In Exodus chapter 12, they did Passover. In all the books of the Gospels, Jesus fulfilled the Passover. In Joshua, they crossed the Jordan on, in and around Nisan 10, and then they met the commander of the Lord on Passover, on the 14th day. There is tons of times in Scripture where Passover is fulfilled over and over and over again. So, all the more reason that the rapture could happen on a Passover or any feast day that's been fulfilled 14 or 16 or 27 times. God loves his appointed times, his moeds. And so um, never a day that we should count out for uh, not being an option for a rapture. Um, so just to remind you, like Passover is about deliverance from sin. It's about deliverance from one location to the other. It's about deliverance from death. It's about deliverance from the power of Satan. 
if we see a couple of verses that kind of speak to this. Galatians 6, 14. We have, But God forbid that I should glory save in the cross for our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world is crucified unto me, and I unto the world. For in Christ Jesus neither circumcision availeth anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creature. Colossians 2, chapter, uh, chapter 2, verse 15. And having spoiled principalities and powers, so this is, we're talking about the cross here, the verse before it, nailing it to the cross. And having spoiled principalities and powers, he made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. So the cross conquers all the principalities and Satan and his minions, conquers death, con conquers the evil, conquers sin. Uh, Hebrews 12, 14, or sorry, Hebrews 2, 14. Um, for as much then as the children are partakers of the flesh and the blood, he also himself likewise took part of the same, that through death he might destroy him that had the power of death, that is, the devil. So we've got the defeat of the devil because of what happened at the cross. Isn't that perfect? In Isaiah 53, it was a prophecy of Christ. Isaiah 53 was a prophecy of Christ. Everything in the Bible points to Christ, and a lot of the Bible points to Passover, more than most of us realize. If you're a new Christian, you, most new Christians don't really realize this. Passover is so big. But Isaiah 53, read the whole thing in your own time. So awesome. But specifically this one, since we're talking about Passover, he was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, as a sheep before her shearers is dumb. So he opened not his mouth. So he did that as a lamb, you know, by his stripes. You know, we are healed, that kind of stuff over here, right? A beautiful chapter, but we'll carry on here. Numbers 9, 24 or sorry, 9, 13. Now, this is talking about second Passover, but still, the principle is still applies in a spiritual sense. Okay, so, Numbers 9, 13. But the man that is clean and is not in a journey and forbid, forbeareth to keep the Passover, even, even the same soul shall be cut off from among his people, because he brought not the offering of the Lord in his appointed season, that the man shall bear his sin. Okay, so, we can't take this, this verse, like, literally, uh, in terms of, if you don't keep Passover, you're not going to make it to heaven. But in a spiritual sense, if you deny what happened on Passover, you'll be cut off. If you deny the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world, and you do not accept that free gift of salvation, you will be cut off. Okay? So, it, you know, you don't actually have to sit in your living room and, and do all the, the rituals of a Passover, but it's, it's freely accepting what Christ did on the cross for you as a perfect lamb. And if you don't honor what actually happened on Passover, you don't accept that free gift of salvation, the Lamb of God, who takes away your sins, then you will be cut off. First Peter, I've got two more verses here. First Peter 2, uh, verse 24. Okay, so we're talking about the same stuff, Passover and the death of Christ. So, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness by whose stripes you are healed. And John 19, verse 6, or sorry, John 14, verse 6, that's what I meant to, to say. My favorite verse, right right here, Jesus said unto him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes cometh unto the Father but by me. So it's not optional. There's no other option. This is a non-negotiable thing. The only way to enter into an eternal relationship with Christ and the Father is through the Son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross for you at Passover. And because of Passover, we are now able to be transformed from this um, earthly state to the heavenly state. State. Oops, one second. Oops. There we go. Because of what happened on Passover, 
we could be transformed from our earthly state to our heavenly state. And uh, covering all those verses, going from Old Testament to New Testament. And um, I love it. I love the season uh, as an overview and as a, just a restating everything I said in a very quick way here as a conclusive statement to what I shared. We have a prophecy of from Daniel 9 going from 458 to 409 to 26 AD. We can bump it over one year to 457 to 408 BC to 27 AD, which is a time when Jesus would have been anointed at his baptism at the beginning of his ministry. I think 26 and 27 AD is a really perfect year to consider for his baptism. Point number two, um, Hosea 6.2 could be saying that it's two days and then after the second day on the third day. So that might mean the second coming would be 2,001 years from the cross. Makes sense that he would actually have to fill a perfect 2,000 years and then add a year. So it makes, for now, now I can actually like, okay, maybe 30 AD was still okay. Uh, but I'm still looking at 31 AD as well, like those two years for the cross. But it doesn't, I, because of Hosea 6.2, it doesn't have to be a perfect, seamless 2,000 years. It could actually be 2,001 years. That makes a lot of sense to me. I showed you some star stuff, a lot of cool connections there. Vetus is coming through that, uh, that second fish right around Resurrection Day. Jupiter and Uranus are together. Um, Jupiter is going into Taurus, which I think represents tribulation this coming weekend. Um, the sun is in Aries, the lamb. We're talking about the Passover lamb this whole time. So there's that. And just a general view of Passover, it was a transformation of a physical departure, a physical departure of a mass multitude. It was a mass exodus, and we are waiting to exit from this planet. In a sense, we're in a, sense, we're in a bit of spiritual slavery here on earth. And so it was the lamb that was able to allow them to escape death and to escape slavery. And then from that point on, they were in the wilderness for 40 years. After the 40 years of the wilderness, they crossed the Jordan in and around Nisan 10, and they they actually had Passover, I think it says that, on the 14th day. I think it says that on Joshua 5. Let me just clarify the actual verse that it's on. I always I always prefer reading my hard copy. Joshua 5.10, Now the children of Israel camped in Gilgal and kept the Passover on the 14th day of the month, that twilight. So there you go. There you go. The Passover was fulfilled. So they left on Passover and they had Passover after they crossed the Jordan on Passover. Perfect. Um, and that was the difference between life and death. It was the blood of the Lamb. And so here we are. We're showing all the scripture. I pray that you get saved, of course. And for the people that are saved, that already know the salvation, and you do have a relationship with Jesus, and you are a child of God, now you're looking for us for encouragement. When? <laughs> the golden question, when is this going to happen? Now, of course, nobody knows, but uh, I'd like to say that we're running out of runway space for a lot of these things to make sense. Um, we're just we're contemplating, we're considering everything, uh, a reminder, just try and remain humble, try and remain teachable. I try so hard to, to be teachable, to uh, to change my mind on certain topics. Um, I was even studying today, you know, it was Christ's ministry. Could it have been less than three and a half? Maybe. That's another thing to consider. But I think the best case is he probably had a three and a half year ministry simply because Elijah had a three and a half year ministry, and the two witnesses will have a three and a half year ministry. Mm -hmm. So why would he have anything less? Because that it really fits the biblical patterns, and God is a God of patterns, and God is a God of numbers. Don't tell me it's numerology. God's got a book called Numbers. God said seven days this, seven days that. Well, it's not numerology. It's God. Uh, he brings Noah on the ark for seven days before the, the flood. It's not numerology. That's what God said. So, um, and everything in the first verse is divisible by seven. 
my goodness, you can do a, a massive study on the first verse in Genesis 1. Seven this, seven that, divide this by seven, multiply that by seven, and you got all this craziness. It's amazing. If you like math, go uh, go get lost in Genesis 1, the first seven words of the Bible. You'll get blown away. Um, Yeah, any questions before I go? Any quick questions, perhaps? I know we've had a long live stream but at this point. Hope you guys are doing great. Yeah, okay. Just looking at the comments here. I was so hyper about uh, Passover 2022, man. I thought it was it. I thought I was so convinced it was going to be Passover 2022. I was all emotionally wound up. I was so pumped. I was just so sold out. So if you're like new to rapture watching and you're like, oh my gosh, it's going to happen like in five days from now. Like I get it. I was completely there where I was like, oh my goodness. Yeah. Like, you know, and then it didn't happen. Like, okay, darn it. It didn't happen. I, I, then the Rico and Rico inside of me was kicking pop cans outside, you know, but, um, um, Christy said, what do you have to say to people that say the rapture is nonsense? Oh, the comment. Uh, so a comment said, what do you got to say to people that say the rapture is nonsense? Usually those people, uh, I don't want to be rude, but they don't read their Bible. A lot of the people don't read their Bible. So step one, I'd say read the whole Bible. And step two, try and find the the hidden message in everything. Like, okay, do I have a heart? Do you, can you guys see that I have a heart? No. Actually, yeah, you, yeah. No, you can't see that I got a heart. So do I have a heart or do I not? Can you see the wind when it blows? Yeah, that's right. Can you see the wind when it blows? Does it move yeah. your hair? Does it, yeah. So you can't see the wind, but you can feel the wind. Behold, I show you a mystery. And, and the word, yeah, I'm going to show you a mystery. And, okay, here's this verse in Hosea. Oh, darn, where is it? Uh, the word is uh, to know. I think it's Hosea. Oh, I think it's right after Hosea 6, too. Faith is the only thing that can please the Lord. Yeah, faith is the only thing that can please the Lord. And uh, it says that, after two days he will revive us, and on the third day he will raise us up. That we may live in his sight, let us know. No. But the word is, the Hebrew word is yada. And the yada, the strong number for that, if you want to find it out, is H3045. And that's like an intimate word. It's not just knowing that God made the world. It's knowing God. Okay, let us know. Let us pursue. That word know is... When Adam was, you know, intimate with Eve, or when some man and woman got together and they got married, and and it's it says that Adam knew Eve. It would it would be Adam yada Eve, or you know whoever who, who was it um, Isaac knew was it Rebecca, right? But anyway, the word is uh, yada yada h three zero four five, and so God wants us to know Him, and. It's about understanding the heart of God. And you can't see my heart, but it's there. And you can't see my emotions, but I've got emotions. God has emotions, and God has a story hidden in the words of the Bible. And Jesus says, I am the Word. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Guess what? Jesus cried. The man had emotions. And there is, a, there is emotions in this Bible. And you're not going to, yeah, you're not going to understand the emotional side of God and why this whole rapture is happening. Yeah, John eleven thirty five, 35, Jesus wept. The shortest chapter, verse apparently in the Bible. He was so sad. He cried. He bled. He, you know, it's so crazy. God has emotions. God w went through some torment when Israel kept on backsliding. He said, why do you guys keep on doing this? God was full of rage in, in the wilderness. And like, ah, let me just destroy them. And Moses says, no, 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 don't, don't do it. Don't, don't, just let me advocate, okay? He goes, okay, I won't destroy them all, you know, fine, you know? And so there is an emotional component to God and to Jesus, and his emotions are, are hidden. His heart is, is hidden in his word. And the story of the rapture, it's, it's, it's literally there in a very analytical way. But it's it's an emotionally there too, like for example, uh, where the literal way to explain this is 
in Leviticus chapter 8, uh, the priests have to be consecrated for seven days, and we are the priests. We are the priests. In Revelation, let me get the, I can get at the Bible verses here. It's Revelation 1 verse 6. Let me get the Bible verses. My thing's a bit frozen here. It says that in Revelation 1 verse 6, that we are kings and priests. So let me get that. And he made us kings and priests. This He's talking to the churches right now. And he made us kings and priests unto God and his Father, to him, be glory and dominion forever and ever. So this is before the throne room scene in Revelation 4 verse 1. Okay, so let me go over there. Revelation 4 verse 1. After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice which I heard was it, uh, as it were, of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up hither, and I will show thee things which must take, which must be thereafter. And so, uh, Revelation 1, verse 6, we are priests. We are priests. Okay, so God has rules. I didn't make up the rules. God did. God made up the rules. Let God be true and every man yeah. a liar. Let God be true and every man a liar, as Christie's saying here. <laughs> and what does it say here? What does the priest have to do to become a priest? Leviticus 8.32 And that which remaineth of the flesh and of the bread shall ye burn with fire. And ye shall not go out of the door of the tabernacle of the congregation seven days. So he, this is the, the chapter when he had to consecrate a priest. You would consecrate a priest in chapter 8. But he can't go outside the door of the tabernacle for seven days. For seven days. That's God's rule. It's not my rule. God made that up. Seven days, not three and a half days. The tribulation is not three and a half days. We can't be consecrated for three and a half days. We must be consecrated for seven days, seven years. Seven days is seven years. We can't do this for three and a half years. It's not four years. It's not five years. It's not six years. It's seven years. We must be, we must, according to God's law, be consecrated for seven days. It's got to happen. Um, another place that's really uh, interesting in an analytical way is Leviticus 12 is that when a woman has a male child it's seven days seven days not three and a half days it's seven days she's unclean there's a male child so that's us in Revelation 12 verse 5 so the woman is unclean for seven days seven days it's seven days not three and a half it's not three and a half it's not three and a half. Seven days. Seven days. Seven days. Revelation 12, verse um, 5. And she brought forth a male child. That's Israel. Therefore, she's unclean for seven days. It's Jacob's trouble for seven days. Seven days. She's unclean for seven days. Seven days. Not three and a half. Um, so that's another thing off the top of my mind. What's another thing that's at the top of my mind with sevens? There's another Leviticus. Oh, yeah, the lepros, leprosy. If you have leprosy, we just read this in our Discord a couple days ago. I can't remember the chapter. It's like Leviticus 13, 14, and 15. It's all about leprosy. And essentially, if you read these chapters, it's constantly seven, 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 seven. seven. Let me see if I can find a seven. Okay. If he has leprosy, you got to take him and isolate him for seven days. So if you have spiritual leprosy, okay, like if you are a person that is unclean, you have to be brought outside the camp for seven days, not three and a half days, not four days, not five days, for seven days. And you have to go to the high priest. You can only be healed because the high priest can only do that for you. Seven days, seven days, not three and a half days. Okay, we got to be you guys get the pattern here? It's seven days. It's not three and a half. It's not. Um, what happened with that that guy that washed in the river? I forget where that verse is. Do you remember where that verse is, Christy? Where Jesus, that... Sorry, I was dealing with the trolls. Oh, the trolls, yeah. <laughs> um, He's going to come back tomorrow and tell you about yourself. Okay. All right. Second, <laughs> Second Kings. <laughs> Where's the, where is it? The guy, he washed in the water seven times. Oh, man, I can't remember where that verse is. I can Google it, I guess. Sorry. Uh, I'm trying to go... Falling short. Go fly through the... Anyway, that guy, it was Naaman. Actually, wait, let me... I can do this. I can probably find this. Na... Is it N-A-A-M-A-N? Let's see. Wash. 
Second Kings. Yeah, it was Second that? Kings five. Yeah, I got it. Second Kings five. Let's see. Where's the seven? Where's the seven? Second Kings five. <laughs> Let's find the seven. Let's go on a little goose hunt here. Second Kings five. Where is it? Wait, tennis. Tennis. Tennis, not tennis. Okay. Oh, yeah. Okay. There it is. Seven. Seven times. Okay. Not three and a half times. Seven times. And Elisha sent a messenger unto him, saying, Go and wash in the Jordan seven times, and thy flesh shall come again to thee, and thou shalt be clean. Seven times. Seven times. But Naaman was wroth. Okay, he was mad and went away and said, Behold, I thought he would surely come out to me and stand and call in the name of the Lord God and strike his hand over the place and recover the leper. Are not um, Abana and Parfara rivers of Damascus better than all these waters of Israel? And may I not wash in them and be clean? So he turned and went away in rage. His servants came near and spoke unto him and said, My father, if the prophet had bid thee do some great things, wouldst thou not have done? How much rather than... What he is saith to thee, wash and be clean. Then went he down and dipped himself seven times in the Jordan. Seven times in the Jordan. Not three and a half. Not four. Not six. Not two. Seven. Seven times. So, um, you know, um, how many seals are there? There's, there's seven. How many angels in Revelation 8? There's seven. How many bulls? Or seven. <laughs> How many trumpets? Did I say that already? There's, no. there's seven. There's lots of sevens. How many churches? There's mm, seven. <laughs> Matthew said, one more time for the people in the back. <laughs> yeah, they're, Holla! They're, <laughs> there's seven. <laughs> Holla, seven. <laughs> yeah. Um, our work week. We got we got seven days in a week. We function on seven day cycles. Like it's, it's not three and a half, man. And we're not in tribulation. We're not we're not in the seven worst years of humanity. How many people got a burger today? Did anybody get a burger? Anybody get a burger and a coke and an ice cream? No, but we did have guacamole. We had guacamole. We had some. We had red onions with the guacamole today. And we put some chicken on it and some special cheese and stuff like that. We got all these options for food. We're not in tribulation with the heat. We got heated control right now. Where, uh, you know, we we could have went out for a fancy dinner. We could have saw a show today. We could have saw a sports game. You could turn your TV on and watch any comfortable program that you want right now. Cindy had a fruit salad. Does that sound like the tribulation? You know, my goodness. And I to, another thing too, the two witnesses. I'm pretty. This is where I, I'm. I'm 98. percent I, I think the two witnesses makes a lot of sense that they're supposed to come at the beginning of the seven years for 1260 days. No rain during the time of the the two witnesses. Fire blowing out of their mouth. Has anybody uh, seen any two guys walking around your neighborhood blowing fire out of their mouth? And has it rained in the last three and a half years in your neighborhood? If it has. <laughs> Very likely we're in the tribulation. Okay. So, um, also, I believe that we are up there before the seals are open. That's another thing. I'll show you those verses real fast. Lickety split. Lickety split. I believe we're up there before the tribulation starts. Before the seals start. Okay. Um, Revelation 5, verse 6. I'm going to go backwards. And I beheld, and lo, in the midst of the throne, and of the four living beasts, and in the midst of the elders, stood a lamb, as it had been slain, having seven horns and the seven eyes, which are the seven spirits of God. So he's got the seven spirits of God. The seven spirits of God. He's got the seven spirits of God in his hand before he opens the seals. He's got the seven spirits of God before he opens the seals. i got to wrap that. He's got the seven spirits of God before he opens the seals. He's got the seven spirits of God before he opens the seals. Okay, let's go backwards now. Revelation 4, verse 5. And out of the throne proceedeth lightnings and thunderings 
and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. So the scripture is interpreting scripture. The seven spirits of God, which are in his hand when he opens the seals, are the seven lamps of fire. Okay, so what are the seven lamps of fire? What are the seven lamps? Let's go back now to Revelation 1, 20. The seven lamps. What are the seven lamps? The mystery of the seven stars, which you saw in my right hand, and the seven golden candlesticks. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches, and the seven candlesticks, which you saw, are the seven churches. Okay, so we've got the seven churches in the Lamb's hand before he opens the seals. Seven churches. The seven churches are the priests who need to be consecrated for seven days. Bam. So I believe that we're up there before the seals. I do not believe the seals have been opened. we got to be up there for seven days because we're priests, according to Leviticus 8, 31 through 36. There we go. Shalom, Israel, and shalom for Israel. Yes, shalom. Shalom, we're praying for the peace of Jerusalem. Yerushalem, the, time, the place of peace. Jesus will be our Prince of Peace. And he's coming. He's coming soon. Can't wait for that. So we, when we pray, we pray for Jesus to come and bring his kingdom and rule and reign and be, be, the, be the man of the hour. That'd be good. I haven't heard anything about the red heifer, but I'll be honest, I haven't really been looking too much. I, I kind of figure that I'll just find out when, when everybody else knows, I'll know with, when it comes to the red heifer thing. But I think that... um. I think they're going to do that the red heifer sacrifice soon because those things are going to expire they're going to get gray hairs real soon so I'm sure that they'll do that this year if they haven't already done it seven colors in God's rainbow perfect and there's a rainbow around his throne bam exactly yeah Roy G. Biv yeah that's right Matthew mm -hmm. question when is Passover Okay, so Passover, I would say that Resurrection Day this week is probably f closer to Friday. And that would mean Crucifixion Day would be somewhere around Tuesday, Wednesday. So Tuesday, Wednesday-ish would be Nissan 14. Somewhere around Thursday, Friday, maybe even Saturday. More on Friday would be Resurrection Day. That That's my take on how the stars are lining up in the in the moon structure and everything. So, so I guess to be clear... Mm, yeah, Tuesday, Wednesday, Nissan 14, and about Friday-ish, Resurrection Day. Yeah, it depends on what calendar you follow. Yeah, I know. Mm -hmm. Yes, pray for the peace of Jerusalem and bring the Messiah back. Amen, Molly. I Yes, right. And I like to say, will we pass over on Passover? Will we pass over on Passover? Possibly. The 22nd is not when he was crucified. Uh, nothing else told us. So the 14th of Nisan. Uh, some, there's a bit of disagreement with the Gospels. Um, some people would think that Nisan 15, but he... It's either Nissan 14 or 15. It was likely Nissan 14 because if he's fulfilling scripture, they would have had to slay the lamb on the 14th of Nissan, according to Exodus 12. So I think one of the Gospels, if memory serves me correct, might indicate the 15th of Nissan. It's probably Nissan 14. It's not. It's definitely not Nissan 22nd. That's that's for sure. Oh, okay. Yeah, you meant April 22nd. Got it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That, that's probably it. Yeah, yeah. Wait, wait, no, wait a second. April 26th. No, I, I think 23rd. Okay, let me show you again, Stellarium. Let me show you again. Well, we'll look at the stars and we'll we'll have a... Here. Let's go back to when the new moon was. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. The new moon, we could probably say that it was in the 9th. We, we, can't, we can't say for certain because it's only... Uh, 
Oh, my computer's a little bit slow right now. 1%. Uh, that's That might be a little bit early for saying that it's... Oh, wait, wait we can bump it over to uh, midnight. Or close to it. Yeah, we might get away with the ninth if that's day one. So if that's day one, we got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. Okay, so I think we can say as early as tomorrow for Nissan fourteen. So um, if you go fourteen, fifteen, sixteen. Okay, so you know what? Nissan fourteen. Yeah, Monday, Tuesday. You know. <laughs> This kind of thing, it's like, it could be any time this week. Like, Monday could be Nissan 14. Tuesday could be Nissan 14. You could even push it to Wednesday. I like how the moon is in Spica, the barley harvest. It's almost a full moon. A full moon is really in the 23rd, which now we're getting close to Libra. I like how the moon is in Libra on the 24th, and then three days later from the 24th, it's in Ophetius which represents Ophetius conquering death, conquering the evil, conquering Satan, that kind of thing. So uh, I like the visual on the 27th, but that looks like it's the last possible day. So that would, that would be Saturday. That's probably pushing it. Would be Saturday is like the last possible day for Resurrection Day in terms of how the stars look, I'd say. Okay, so I think we'll leave it there, guys. Uh, thanks for hanging out. Love you all very much. Get tight with Christ. And we are one day closer. Hope to see in the clouds very soon. Keep on doing the Jesus thing. And we'll hang out soon. And go, Jesus, go. We'll be saying that soon as a community. Go, Jesus, go. Go, Jesus, go. Right behind him. Go, Jesus, go. Pop on your horse and do whatever you got to do. And uh, I'll bring the popcorn. <laughs> okay. Take it easy, guys. Love you. Talk soon.